All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Let's Discuss with Parsons TKO. <laughs> I am your always fun and chipper and drink too much coffee host, Tony Kopechny, the CEO and co-founder of Parsons TKO. And today uh, for our topic, of let's discuss taxonomy. I'm joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Nate Parsons and Stefan Berg Kruger, who you may have seen in another episode or two. Uh, but I'll let them just introduce themselves in case it's your first time joining us. Maybe Nate, you go first. All right. I'm with, as Tony has mentioned, I'm uh, Nate Parsons, uh, Chief Strategy Officer of Parsons TKO and uh, also co-founder. And I'm Stefan Bird Kruger, Chief Analytics Officer at Parsons TKO, and I lead the uh, data strategy team where we spend quite a lot of time talking about taxonomy, actually. Uh, it's become sort of a, a daily daily conversation for us as uh, taxonomy touches a lot of parts of how organizations understand their content and their performance. So very much looking forward to this one. So, you know, our Let's Discuss conversations are informal, but informed uh, topics and things that we like to discuss. As a company, we were having these types of conversations internally. And literally today's was from a ginormous Slack thread that started two days ago between Stefan and Nate that was on the topic of taxonomy. Um, it comes up a lot in conversations here. Uh, so to kick it off, I mean, I think the word taxonomy, I mean, I've been in the game for 20 some years now. I remember at a certain organization I was working at in 2007 or 2008, I had it was like a seven foot tall sheet of paper with all the possible words. And we had a, we actually had a library staff at the time. So when they were getting in on it and I would take this to the executive, all these different vice president's offices, and go, you need to decide on these words, you know, that's, but that's one basic probably understanding taxonomy. And, but it's just to note that I, I think the word potentially has lots of different meanings for different folks, which, probably obscures or hinders what we really mean by it from the technical sense of how it can help an organization. So uh, I hope that's maybe a good leading question for, for one of you to dive in with. Uh, yeah, thoughts? Is the word too big? I don't know. Can we define it? Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, I think, you know, the way that for a lot of folks that they got, they first encounter taxonomy and where it's kind of been historically a part of the digital landscape is that it's been something that happened on websites where, you know, content items would have these tags, these like words at the bottom of the post or the story or whatever that would be the summary of the three important or five important kind of things that the story was about. And they were sort of these almost summarizations of longer form content. And, you know, because of that, and because of the way that a lot of people thought about them, they were often applied after the fact. People would write a story, and then they would think, ah, what is this story about? And they would select the content items that they thought it was from, from this list, and that would become the taxonomy that was applied. And over the course of time, people sort of waffled between two kinds of polls. One, where they wanted to be very exhaustive, and they would have these really big taxonomies, like those pages and pages of things, where it was like, oh, well, Northern Ireland is different from Southern Ireland, which is different from Western Ireland. But this is also about wintertime in Ireland, and those would all get different tags on the story, you know? And then there was the other school of thought, which was like, no, it's going to be highly managed and you can't make up any other tags and it's just going to be this thing. So if you had a story about Ireland and you didn't have an Ireland tag, you're like, well, it's about the UK. That's close enough. Bam, I'm going to put the UK tag on this thing and then off you go, right? And like those are kind of the ways that most taxonomy got applied. And because of that, you know, sort of, uh, usage, you know, the way that it often was used by users once it had been applied is they would click on those tags to see more stories about that particular topic. And what they would see is then a big list of content that all shared that tag, right? And so that was kind of taxonomy as a system, right? And as you can imagine, it's all pretty unintentional. It's pretty divorced from, you know, organizational strategy. And it doesn't have a lot to do with helping the user understand what your opinions are, right? Because they don't discover the taxonomy in full. They discover it in these little atomic pieces, right? They find one tag, and that's how they know about your taxonomy. They don't really get to see your understanding of the, you know, descriptive world, the way your taxonomy is organized. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll jump in there. I'm I'm getting climbing back on board. I have to say, given my 
Irish family members, some of the things you said about uh, uh, tagging Ireland in different ways were hard to recover from. But, <laughs> but, but I will say that I think that's exactly right. And I think that heritage of taxonomy in the web world has been a really tough thing for people to overcome. Uh, and this stems from a conversation I just had yesterday uh, where that use of taxonomy as a way to browse your content is actually not that engaging a user experience for users. And so I think a lot of people have this heritage. This is the one way they've ever seen taxonomy used on a website. That's the most forward facing way that it's used on a website. And then people who watch the analytics say, oh, well, people don't even really use that. So why should I care? And so it gets really neglected uh, in a lot of ways. But I think that misses out on this whole world of opportunity of, of ways in which taxonomy can be leveraged, both through taking those features, those sort of traditional features of taxonomy on a website and making them better, actually spending some time on user experience, uh, figuring out how you can use it to you know, syndicate content. Well, I think, yeah, we, we, could, we could go on and, and list a whole bunch of ways uh, in which, uh, which taxonomy can be used UX-wise. But then I think beyond that, there's taxonomy and its role for reporting and measurement, being able to actually explore what people do with your content based on how you think of your content. There's taxonomy for you know, strategic alignment. There's taxonomy for integrating your systems. And so I think there's just so many different ways to, to slice and dice your content uh, and, and reach into you know, the, the different use cases of those taxonomies. I don't know, Nate, I mean, of, of all those things, I mean, which ones, which ones, I guess, have you seen the most potential for organizations to do something new and revolutionary? Yeah, I think the, the, the first one is just switching around where in the strategic process taxonomy emerges or occurs, you know, which is to say, like, you know, every organization I've ever encountered has an, a, a theory of education or a theory of change about how the world is and how it could be better and how they can influence it. And that's often represented in uh, an ephemeral and kind of conversational way within those organizations and it's rarely captured in any kind of visual document or any kind of strategy document and you know ironically there are millions of things that look just like taxonomies that people don't call taxonomies to help come up with their strategies like two popular ones are mind maps which people do to kind of brainstorm and find all the things that are connected and concept maps which are how are these two concepts related? Which one is, is important in the hierarchy? And how should you learn things like, oh, this one before this one before this one, that sort of order of operation of things. And, you know, those documents are really taxonomies. You know, they're just not considered as such, and they're rarely formalized as such. They're used as initial tools, and then they are graduate to other things that don't even look like those, and they're kind of left behind. And then they sort of sometimes reemerge in some kind of, you know, Frankenstein format eventually back through the taxonomy system that gets applied. But the most revolutionary thing is just to start and continue using a visual taxonomy document, you know, and I think that that does a couple of amazing things in the organizations that do it. One, they have serious conversations about the kind of uh, content and the kind of outreach they're going to conduct because they, you know, need to be able to put content into each of the taxonomy buckets that they're creating, you know. They also create consensus around what are the con the the correlations of topics, like these three atomic things roll up to this bigger thing, and that's important, and we want to talk about the bigger thing. And it's really easy for experts, especially, to miss the middle, right? They start with their mission, and they get right down into the details, but then that flow of like, hey, this major concept is supported by all these minor concepts we're working on, and we chose these minor concepts because they help advance this major concept is often sort of undersold or implied, but not actually spoken to. So it helps with that. And, you know, I think there's most, you know, sort of dramatically from a systems level, when you start and, and use that taxonomy, it doesn't just exist on the web. It exists on, you know, content records in the CRM. It exists in how email and outreach is conducted. It exists in how reports are, are quantified. It reports how funding is allocated. It reports in terms of strategy. Oh, we're going to do this this year. And, you know, in two more years, we're going to stop working on this part of the tree. We're going to add this part of the tree. And it becomes a management function. So I think, that, you know, ironically, this the most amazing part of it is just starting with it and sticking with it. But it's, it's like, you know, done by, you know, a hundredth of the organizations we run into. So as you guys are talking, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, 
we drive really hard into digital transformation, right? Every organization is needing to do this now. You like it or not, it is here and you've got to start maneuvering. And taxonomy today, in that essence, in my head, it becomes this underpinning, right? Like it actually becomes an essential element where when I think of, it was funny because you're were, you were talking about tagging and all the different tags and all I could think of was web 2.0. Now you can like do the content yourself. So <laughs> it was web 2.0 to blame, but you know, there was this moment of, oh, I get taxonomy is not this crazy thing that librarians talk about all the time. It, it's this other piece of information I could put out for findability. Because when the web is still a little newer, right? Oh, I want to really make sure that because everyone believed, at least I did, I think in like 2002, that if I added these tags, somehow some search engine, maybe Google call it, would grab it and everybody would find my stuff. So I guess two things, right? I mean, does it really help with findability? Where, where does the Google machine play into things like this? And then thinking about taxonomy, I think you've said it before, Nate, or maybe with Stefan, but taxonomy as a strategy, right? Because that, that really underpins and strengthens the componentry of a digital transformation. Thoughts? I mean, I'll I'll speak from the why is it I mean why is it useful in the in the technical side and, and the technical systems. I mean, I think one of the biggest things. I mean, if you want the exciting answer, uh, it, personalization, personalization and marketing automation, they all completely depend on consistent and comprehensive and well managed, well curated taxonomies. You know, Nate was talking about how taxonomy is can be and should be uh, reflected across all of your systems. All of your systems have to play a role in creating a cohesive uh, user experience for your audiences. And unless you can figure out, here's the topics that I cover on the website, here are the topics that people are interested in, here are the topics that we're emailing people about, Unless you can connect the dots between those, you can't create that cohesive experience. Every, every time you talk to a person, it's from scratch, and they're just a, a new person in the way you're writing for them. And so taxonomy can be the connective tissue between all these different systems. And so I, I think you know, this is even setting SEO aside. How do you, SEO is about how do you find, get, help people find you, but once people have found you, how do you build a relationship with them? And, and that's where taxonomy is crucially important for you to be able to learn about your audiences and their interests in a structured way that your systems can then also use uh, to make decisions about outreach. Uh, so I think, I think that's, you know, that alone, I think it makes the case for, for taxonomy. Yeah, just to, to play on that a little bit, you know, one of the, the coming evolutions in technology is the movement from systems that filter content uh, dictionaries down to what you're looking for. Like Google tries to filter the whole web down into like the 10 or 20 things it thinks you might be interested in to a systems that try and understand your intent and then try and match things that fit your intent better. And, you know, everyone has sort of experienced this with either Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant or some, one of those systems where you're like, tell me the weather in Denver, right? And it tries to figure out that you want to know the weather report in Denver, Colorado, because you're in the United States and it's implying all these things. And it's trying to figure out your intention and then give you data that fits your intention. And, you know, taxonomies are an important stepping stone to that because when you think about it um, from just a pure content perspective, when you apply a taxonomy term to a piece of content, you're declaring an active intent. You're saying, I tried to make this content about this term you know, for better or for worse, for more accuracy or less accuracy, that's what you're declaring. And I think that there's also going to be an evolution in what is in the taxonomy as well. You know, taxonomies historically have been sort of almost, uh, you know, library or research library focused in the sense of like, oh, we'll have a region's taxonomy and it'll have all the places and we'll have, you know, a concepts taxonomy and we'll have all the concepts in it or something like that. But, you know, of course, those don't really include intent, right? Like, are you trying to learn about this thing? Are you trying to keep up with this thing? Are you an expert in this? Are you a student in this? And I think that the next evolution in terms of how our taxonomy is going to go is going to start to pull in some of those intent factors into taxonomy because I think it is, it's part of the learning, right? Like if you have a model for how somebody should learn about a concept, you know, you take them from first hearing about it to a journey uh, through it and then eventually, you know, some level of understanding or expertise in it. And I think, you know, that's similar to how, uh, you know, 
a lot of nonprofits try and think about engaging their audiences, right? Like we want to take somebody from first hearing about the nonprofit, becoming a strong, you know, booster of the nonprofit or having a lot of affinity for, for the mission, you know? And I think all of that sort of speaks to their being intention, sort of latent in these like sort of systems and in these content. And, you know, taxonomies, I think will continue to evolve to include intent as part of the, the, the strategy captured with them. So I have several thoughts now from that. Uh, and I don't, I have to throw them all out and then you all decide how you want to, to take them from there. I mean, on the intent piece, you know, interesting. So what if I was at my, what if my organization had a great taxonomy, but now I want to evolve it or adapt it or tweak it. Can I do that without losing all of the great connections, you know, stuff and think to your point for this data reporting I was able to do and the journeys I was able to, like, how do I evolve it? What, what does that do? And, you know, you, we also talked about mapping it between systems. But it feels, at least in my experience, it always seems to stem from a communications website perspective. And then there's always the debate with whoever the program or department is that might own some knowledge area. Uh, it's rarely ever, in my experience, out from the CRM experience that goes back into the other places. So uh, that's a whole bunch of like where my head went. Uh, and you know how my brain goes like an amoeba. So I'll let you all attack what I threw out there, however you'd like to, if you've got thoughts on it. Yeah, I'll dive in real quick. Just that um, one of the things that, that, that we try and bring to you know, our, one of the perspectives we bring to our client engagements, which I do think is pretty unique to, to PTKO, is this concept of portfolio management. And what I mean by that is that we try and describe both the effort it takes to do something, the value, business value produced by doing that thing, and the time period in which you're going to both commit to doing something and reevaluate doing something and potentially, you know, replace or modify or evolve something at the end of that. And, you know, I think content libraries, that's a key one, right? Like people are always like, oh, you know, how do we revisit old content or how do we deal with stale content? The same thing applies to taxonomies, right? Like where the taxonomy exists really in a period of time. You know, we kind of see it as this like permanent like obelisk that's been planted into the sand. But the reality is it's like a crop that we plant every year and sometimes we need to change the mix, right? We might need, you know, more soybeans this year or more corn this year. And that's the same thing with like how we actually create things that are measured by the taxonomy, right? Like we may have more content in one area, we may have a new sort of strain or new evolution of things that we want to add to it. We may want to like let some things like fallow for a little while and we may decide that something we're never going to do again. And, you know, I think that the key for evolution there is, is just that it's planned and intentional. You know, I think that what really happens in a lot of organizations is that they say, we want to start doing X. And so Y stops because there's not enough time or ability to do it, not because there's an intentional plan to sunset it. And I think that's where most of the business value is lost and much of the user dissatisfaction occurs. You know, instead of saying, hey, we know you're trying to do X and we're focused on Y now and here's where you can still find what we did on X and it's still relevant, but it's sunset. A lot of organizations kind of play the shell game of like, oh, where are we creating content? We won't tell you and you won't know. You'll just have to discover it, you know, and you won't find the places that are stale and we're not covering because we're not going to tell you that either. And I think that's a real trouble, right? Like it makes them, it makes them feel like they're covering more ground, but really what they're doing is obscuring their best and newest work. And I think that's part of the, the evolution piece, right? Like it needs to be intentional and not just a matter of capacity. And I, Tony, I want to go back to your question and build on Nate's word intentionality. And I think that question of why people think of taxonomy in the web world and usually only in the website world and where that disconnect to all the other systems comes from. I think a lot of it just has to do with the, the history of websites and content management systems. I mean, you think about Drupal, you know, you know, 10 years plus ago, taxonomy was one of the core native features when you're building a new Drupal site. It's right there. What's your taxonomy? And so I think structurally, 
it was forced on people a, a little bit in, in the web world for, for good. And I think that was a, a, you know, one of the positive aspects of those early approaches to content management system building. But you don't have that. And it's not as obvious a piece in a lot of other systems. When you think about how CRMs are designed, when you think about how social publishing platforms are designed, when you think about email marketing systems. I mean, you know, when it comes down to a taxonomy, the difference between taxonomy and, and metadata and tags, it's all semantic. And, you know, they're, they're all similar concepts. It's all information about the thing that you have, um, whether the thing you have is a, a piece of content on your website, a person in your CRM, a message that's going outbound. Um, it, it's all metadata. And I think one of the one of the key things that differentiates taxonomy as you know capital T taxonomy is that intentionality. It is planned metadata. It's metadata with a strategy, metadata with a purpose, and metadata that you use to organize your thinking. You know the way you structure um, everything that you do with your audiences, and so I, I think that piece is really important. And and I do think there is uh, you know to that you know, how do you move forward with it? Having that intentionality where you say, this is how I'm going to manage my content and in all the different dimensions, whether it's topic, whether it's category, region, audience intent, call to action, all of these things could be a taxonomy. Um, it's just a question of how you want to represent your content strategy and your audience engagement strategy in the systems that execute those things. Um, and, and having that parity is, is really crucial. So, you know, I would say to go from where you started there, right, where people seem surprised that it should be in these other systems. I'll say I'm surprised that in our data strategy practice, how often it kept coming up from you, because I wouldn't have thought about that, right? In my experience being in communications or marketing and coming, I oh, sure, why do I need this taxonomy to go to my data strategy and my reporting? So I don't... It, yeah, what do you want to say about that? Because that, that was newish to me. Uh, but I'm yeah. fully supportive of you. I'd like the rest of the world <laughs> to know why, why you talk about it, though, and, and where it, it creates limits for the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, we've, I think we have a whole other um, episode about this, and I'm sure we will have many more. Um, but in short, when people ask questions of their data, it is to inform their strategy. And so the kinds of questions they ask are, how does our content about this topic perform? Or how does our content by this department perform? Or how does our content designed to get people to sign up for the annual gala perform? All of these things are context about your content, about your organization. And in order for analytics to report on that, analytics needs to be informed about that. And, and fitting your taxonomy into your analytics is what makes that possible. Because Google Analytics, when you set it up, it, it knows nothing about the website that it's running on. It knows nothing about your organization. And so until you teach Google Analytics, this is, this, this is what the topic is on any particular page. Unless you give it that context, it can't report out, certainly not cleanly, not without hours and hours of tedious lining up rows and doing it in ways that you're certainly going to do differently next time. And so with that lost efficiency, lost consistency. Um, so, so having that mapped together from your CMS into your analytics and then from your analytics back into your CRM um, and, and being able to follow the thread uh, of, of engagement across topics, across content types, whatever question you might want to ask is, is really transformational for a lot of organizations. Yeah, just, just to tag on to that, if I could real quick, um, you know, one of the reasons we have this, this approach, this engagement architecture approach that we talk a lot about is because it's really an organizational operating system. You know, it's a way for organizations to understand how to cohesively and strategically configure all of their systems, their business processes, and even their staff time and allocations in a way that mar marries up and supports the strategy that they're trying to pursue. You know, and I think that, you know, Stefan, what you're saying, you know, just fits that to a T and really explains it well, which is that, you know, the organization to work well has to have a unified operating system for what content means, what concepts mean, what the strategies are, what we're pursuing, how we report on them, how we adjust and you know, try and optimize, you know, the tactics that are, you know, being used to 
pursue a strategy and when a strategy may have reached a plateau that is sufficient, you know, maybe it's time to work on the second strategic goal because the first goal is sufficiently met, you know, and none of those things can happen if you're fighting yourself and fighting your own, you know, data inequality problems and all sorts of other things to try and get to the, those sort of business insights. And, you know, that's part of what taxonomy is really critical for is that it is one of the, you know, key, you know, structural beams in your, you know, your platform, you know, and if you don't have that, your, you know, operating system is going to perform inefficiently and, you know, probably inexactly. Yeah. And once you have this in place, so many new things become possible. I think a lot of organizations that integrate this for the first time suddenly learn a lot about their content. I think a lot of organizations make assumptions about even, even something as basic as what they produce. Uh, and, and once you actually start being able to track it, you can say, oh, well, you actually produce five times as much about Syria as you do about Jordan. Uh, and, and being able to actually see that difference in terms of staff effort, in terms of editorial process, uh, you know, there, there are so many things you can learn from this. I mean, if you include things like publish date, uh, you can actually see timelines of when your organization talked about certain issues. Um, there, there's just so many insights about your audience, about engagement, but also about your organization that you can start to, to collect um, the more and more you represent your, your content strategy in your data. All right, so I'm listening to y'all and I'm taking it in, I'm absorbing it and, and you're winning me over, but my head goes to two places again. What, why every website, you know, we know this, we, we even say we don't build websites, right? But we still do website redesigns for organizations, but we refer to them as business systems, right? Because it is. But every website redesign goes back into, let's talk about our taxonomy. Why does it always end up there? Why are we not settled? And then my, my secondary thought to that is, okay, I redesigned two years ago, and we fought for three to four weeks about these terms and nailed it down and whittled it. And, oh, now you're telling me I got to change it again? Or, or, or do I have a solid base to build from? I leave my anxieties. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, if taxonomy is something an organization focuses on and has a lot of sunlight on, then those website redesigns can usually leverage it and use that as a jumping off point to make good decisions about how to improve the website. You know, and I think in the very best cases, the website's deficiencies or the, the reason you're, you're improving or changing the website are based off the taxonomy. Like the taxonomy is trying to do X and the website is preventing it from achieving that goal. You know, but the reality is for a lot of organizations, you know, the, the, the organizations that don't have much sunlight on their taxonomy or don't treat it as a strategic planning tool is that those redesigns become a way to suddenly rethink how outreach is occurring and to rethink what organizational priorities are about communications and, and concept mapping and concept, you know, communication to the outside world. And so they kind of naturally always reopen the taxonomy door because they're really pointing at the real underlying problem, which is that there's not a, a consensus of what the strategic plan of attack should be for content creation and outreach based off of that and education and motivation based off of that. And, you know, if that core piece were well settled, then the taxonomy probably wouldn't change that much website redesign and website redesign, you know, or if it did, it would simply be optimizing, not wholesale changing, you know, but the reality is it's, you know, most executives at nonprofits or even most organizations have never seen their taxonomy, aren't aware of it, and we're certainly never asked to give strategic guidance or input into its creation. And so I think that that just kind of highlights the problem, right? It's like the back of the train when it needs to be the front of the train. And because of that, when executives are trying to notionally move towards it, it creates a lot of cascade effects down into it, but it's always addressed downstream instead of being brought back up to the front and said, okay, let's nail this down. Let's get this. This is our guiding document for then doing other kinds of like web designing things like site maps and content types and structures and all that. I think, I think what I would say first to your question, Tony, is that if you have put work into your taxonomy, I am not telling you that you need to change your taxonomy. Uh, the first thing you need to do is to integrate your taxonomy into more of your systems. I humbly would suggest analytics first. Uh, and I think 
with analytics integrated with your taxonomy, you are going to learn a lot about it. And you are going to learn a lot about how your organization uses it. And you're going to learn a lot about how your audiences respond to different parts of your taxonomy. Once you have learned those things, um, I think you may want to change your taxonomy because you're just going to start to see these are the answers. Um, these are the things that are working well. These are the things that aren't getting any sunlight, that aren't delivering any value. And I think that's going to drive changes to the organization organically without needing to have a summit, without needing to do a week's long process. I think just day to day in meetings that your staff have with one another about how to plan the website, I think you could start to see that evolution. And then I think it truly is evolutionary and not something fast and hard and painful. So I think, I think that's really got to be the first step for a lot of organizations. And if you allow for that kind of data-informed growth that's made possible by integrating your taxonomy into your analytics, then I think you can actually put off a lot of the hard changes that, that you know, you're talking about. I think, you know, to Nate's point, if, uh, if you have your taxonomy up to date and you're managing it well, and you're using what you learn about it to improve the way it's represented on your website, you're probably pushing off your next website redesign. And, and I think you can actually get more from what you have uh, for a longer term. And just to tie in that one last thing that did make me think of something else, which is that, uh, you know, one of the things that the taxonomy can do from both the data perspective and the content strategy perspective is help you understand if you are inadvertently as an organization creating, you know, too much content in one area and too little in another. And most importantly on that, what the cadence of that creation is, you know, there are certain sorts of content that are kind of like gateway content to your, your, you know, deeper materials. And those ones are often the things that, that you need to make sure are happening on a regular basis and the content pool and that is increasing in the right amount you know like uh it's really common for say for think tanks to write a lot of expert content but not a lot of on-ramping content and maybe not enough you know uh summarization content for policymakers, right and like that's a simple place where like having a taxonomy in place that is reported on well from data might really change your internal focus about just content creation and you know that might have far more, well, it's, it's very likely to have better impacts than redesigning the website, you know, because even if you redesign the website to have a really nice on-ramping place, if it's a ghost town, that's not going to help any, you know, I think it, you really have to have a, a whole, you know, 360 view of these things. You can't just change, you know, the delivery and assume that, you know, the things you're putting into the delivery are better, right? You have to go back to the factory and figure out what's happening before you get to delivery. So, you know, Transformation, digital transformation is big. It tends to require, but it, and you, because you both have said the word several times now, which is integration. But the integrator within an organization that, you know, even if you're still siloed, work still has to start cutting horizontally to really be what you need to be as an organization now with the tools that are out there. Where, where should ownership of taxonomy live? Who should be in charge of that? Like, where does it start? Who owns it? Are there tools to manage it? How would I manage it? What do I do? Help me. Help me, everyone. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll put my two cents in first here, which is uh, the higher the better in the hierarchy is the first thing I'd say. You know, the more, you know, executive insight the better because it's a strategic focus, right? Like if you if you have someone down in the weeds doing it, they might be keeping it up to date, but it might be drifting from the organizational strategy, but really it needs to be a reflection of organizational strategy. Um, you know, and I'd say as much as possible, that person or that department underneath that person should act as a facilitator and an organizer and a convener of discussions because a lot of the conflicts that need to be resolved in a taxonomy discussion are valuable for more reasons than just fixing the terms in the taxonomy, right? Like they have to do with uh, misalignment or overlap or, you know, uh, you know, potentially a focus of effort that needs to be either, you know, coordinated more tightly or more clearly bright linely separated, you know, so I think that's key. There's tons of tools for managing these things. Um, you know, I'd say the medium to larger size organizations um, need to be investing in tools that not just 
allow the management of this from an editorial perspective to work out well, but the distribution of the changes to work out well. You know, like if you make an update to it, how does it get, you know, announced to everybody who needs to get with the program? And, you know, that's why for a lot of our, you know, engagement architecture or technical infrastructure, we often recommend that there's a thing called a taxonomy service or taxonomy API. And really what it is, is it's a broadcast beacon that all the other systems listen to that say, hey, when I make a change here, I'm going to reflect it here, here, and here. And in the very best and most sophisticated ways that often also will tell you what happens to any terms that have been, you know, merged or moved or depreciated. And it says, oh, you know, redirect term A to term B or term A is now part of term B or whatever it is, you know. And I think that kind of system is going to be like the, you know, uh, this is one of the big separators between really successful and dynamic organizations and ones that are less so. Because, you know, when you get to voice and other kinds of search technologies, you don't get, you know, three pages of Google results to get it right. You get one or two answers, right? No one's going to listen to a half hour of Alexa telling them possible results, right? Not going to happen. So there's a huge focusing moment coming, which is like, you got to get closer to the top of the intention to quality ratio. You know, like if you're down in the like, oh, you'll find it eventually, you're not going to be a winner in the new economy. And, you know, that's part of why things like these taxonomy services that are abstract and technical and behind the scenes actually are going to be big differentiators for organizations. I, I I agree completely, and and I think that you know it, it answers both of the questions. It's who should own it and and where should it live in the hierarchy. I do think higher up because it needs to affect so many systems. If it's just the web team that owes, owns taxonomy, then only your website's going to know about your taxonomy, and you're leaving a lot of value on the floor. Um, and so I, I think it does need to be high up, and and I do think that there needs to be strong governance uh, around taxonomy. You know, when you think about the organizations who have done it well, um, it never happens by accident. It happens because there's a Tony running around the office with a six page printout of words, um, you know, forcing people to, to you know, pitch in. And, and there is that expectation that I can't just click one or two terms and call it a day. Um, that we actually have to be thoughtful about how we use it, how we relate content to it, uh, and then how that relates to, to our other systems as well. Um, so it does require a good bit of discipline um, and, and clarity and a mandate to do so. Um, so I do think that's important. And when an organization does reach the point where it, it can invest in something like that taxonomy service, uh, that I think is a real game changer because the, the lack of consistency or lack of comprehensiveness in how taxonomy is applied is most often the failing. Um, this is something that we run into time and time again. Even organizations that have a taxonomy, even organizations that have integrated with their data, we then report on that data and it says, oh, well, only 1% of your content is about your major topic. And, and they're like, well, that, that just can't be, you know, this, your data is wrong. Uh, well, it's because your taxonomy is wrong because you haven't actually applied it anywhere. And that's all we have. That's the only way we can know that this content is about your mission. And so, uh, you know, solving that problem, the, the, that discipline question, whether that's done through business process, you know, make it a required field in your systems as you publish things, um, or just, you know, you have to tag it because you're going to have to report on it later. Um, having those motivations can help, but if you can get to the taxonomy service perspective, there you have machine level excellence and consistency. Everything goes through the same rules. Everything goes through the same process. And instead of 1%, you know, coverage of your taxonomy, you're instantly at 100%. Um, and so that's one of the things, you know, we've, we've uh, talked about a lot and we've, uh, you know, been looking into is how our clients can leverage things like machine learning to automatically recognize what tags and terms apply to a piece of content and, and make sure that you have that, that consistency. Yeah, I'll go you one step further on that, which is uh, if you want to extend your organization's business intelligence out into the social world, having a strong taxonomy lets you do things like map hashtags back to your taxonomy terms and then track how much your strategy has traction or has you know, conversation out in the social world based off of those organic tags that are emerging that other people are having conversations about. And guess what? That's super duper hard to do if you don't have a good taxonomy. Like, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time debating the mappings of all these things back to things. So. 
So it sounds to me, I mean, we're going for this. I could probably, we could probably keep this conversation going for a while, but we probably should get to a, a closure at some point. So I'm convinced you got me right. Uh, but you know, when I, when I think about the conversations I'm having with our clients, prospective clients, or just people in the community, this always reminds me when I was working more in global development and everybody wanted to fund the vaccine. Nobody wanted to build the road, right? Because building roads, that was just, well, I mean, well, you dig ditches, who wants to do that? And, but you need roads to get the vaccines to the people who need the vaccines, right? Taxonomy feels that way to me a lot. And I, I think what I'm hearing here too is there's going to be winners and losers. And it's, this is all going to happen so much faster than I think everybody's ready for. You know, as a conversation was in yesterday, um, the executive kept talking about AI in the next five years. I was like, I think you need to shrink that down to three. And that might even be not enough, right? It might even be less than that. So it, it sounds like this is the type of thing I, we got to dive in. So what's the starting point? What do, what do I do today? I'm organization X. You just came in. Now you've, you've got me. I, I believe it. I am nervous. I don't want to be one of the losers. Uh, I don't want to get left behind. I do. Well, I think the first thing, you know, in terms is to narrow the question a little bit, even for those organizations, right? Like, what are the things, the, the three things that you want to really help people understand or know or get educated on? And then to sort of use that as a jumping off point to think about all the different ways that you need to, you know, talk and educate them about those things. Because that's kind of the real basis of starting a structured taxonomy, right? It's not what do you have, it's where do you want to go? <laughs> and I think that's the key thing that a lot of organizations need to start with is they need to start seeing this as a way to document where they want to go and where they want to be successful and a lot less like what do I already have and you know if you see it as a, a way to inventory the junk in your storage that you're renting then you're never going to get anywhere right like this needs to be a blueprint for the engine you're building I think that's right and I think immediately after that you need to be able to report on it and i think i think having that integration with the analytics is i mean it's so central to making the rest of your data worthwhile and and more interesting and able to answer the kinds of questions your staff ask and and i think that's probably if you already have a data practice if you have a, a culture of data if you have staff who are bringing questions about performance i think that's actually really useful and perhaps unusual place to look to inform your taxonomy is figuring out what you want to know and that might show you some of the gaps in your taxonomy because if you want to know how people respond to content written for the media uh, but there's nothing in your site there's nothing in your taxonomy there's nothing in your content types that say this was written for the media it's really hard to report on that and so being able to think through what are the strategic changes you're trying to make that people are asking questions about and you can look at those questions for inspiration uh, that might paint the paint the path or whatever you paint uh, paint a picture uh, for uh, for what your future state taxonomy ought to look like you know i'm wondering for any of our viewers and an audience that might be made it this far in with us and they're, and they're thinking through this i mean how do you do you have thoughts on how to create the the groundswell or the champions internally to start talking about this like please stop talking about the next system how is that system going to connect to this is there a way to find those champions internally yeah well whoever the champions the natural champions really are the people who need to get results you know which is <laughs> to say like the people who who are on the front lines trying to actually make your mission go from theoretical to you know actual and enabled, you know, and, you know, in a lot of organizations, especially in the nonprofit world, those are the people doing development work, the people who are getting people to financially fund and support the organization. They're natural people to be promoters of this, right? Because they need to create and demonstrate value for the people donating. They need to explain why the organization's mission and approach is successful and likely to work and you know something that should there be should be more of in the world so there there's you know really what it comes down to are the people who need things done are the people who are the most likely champions of this the problem is they're rarely 
in the back office, so to speak, you know, worrying about all this infrastructure that's getting in the way of them being successful, you know, and I think that's one of the tricks here for the empowerment. They, those are the best allies. Those people know what needs to be done and what they need to have reported on, what they need to be able to demonstrate, what the real motivating factors are. Um, you know, and that goes also for people who deal with volunteers or anyone else who's really supporting an organization directly, right? But like, we need to connect those folks or those people and organizations need to get connected with the folks at the highest level who are saying, let's make our strategy from here flow through the organization to here where you're actually trying to use it at the edge, you know, and that middle is where most of this stuff doesn't get, you know, created or, or championed strongly enough. And so that's why you kind of need it at the top and at the edge, and then they can kind of work the middle to like get it to, you know, actually occur in a productive way. Any thoughts on that, Stefan? I think that's exactly right. You know, where my head goes there, whenever you're talking about taxonomy and all the things an organization does, all the ways in which an organization does and has thought about their their content, their audiences, long tenured staff, uh, you know, is where my head goes. Because I think the long tenured staff often have a wealth of organizational context, knowledge about what things exist, why they were done, how they've been used, how they could be used, you know, what the original intent was that perhaps got lost somewhere along the way. Um, so I think, I think just bringing together, you know, anyone who's been around and, uh, and can talk about that history is really, really powerful. And I also think there's, there's another piece there, which is that those long tenured staff can often be the biggest blockers to change. Um, and so I think making sure that you engage them in a forward looking conversation about what could our taxonomy or you know, we should be saying taxonomies um, uh, become because there are often many that you have to consider uh, and, and really finding the, the good ideas that got left in the sands of time. Because you know, we're not even saying that your future state has to be completely novel and totally new. Truth is, there's probably a lot of good stuff in your history. And so you have to be able to bring it all together, you know, sift through it, find the gold, and, uh, and then make that a part of the future, while also making a plan for the uh, retirement of, uh, of ideas that have lost their value. Well, it sounds like, you know, from that desired future state, that vision of this transformed organization, that the road and the pathway really is built by digging in and getting the right taxonomies mm -hmm. laid out um, and set into place. So with that, I don't know. I mean, that sounded like a pretty good close to me, but I don't know if you had any last thoughts you wanted to leave our viewers with. Well, just that, you know, it's probably a lot of people who work in communications are thinking this, but, you know, taxonomy and, and ontology and taxonomies are all sort of tied to content strategy and this idea of, you know, user engagement and what are the stages of user engagement and what do we need to do to nurture that user engagement? And it's just kind of probably worth pointing out that these are all sort of part of a, a sort of engagement triangle, right? Where you need to have the right stages figured out for how you're going to engage users. You need content in each of those stages and you need conceptually to be able to measure and manage those, where people are in that those stages. And taxonomy is kind of in a critical piece of that triangle of making that all happen. And, you know, if you're not thinking about it that way, that's a useful way for communications people to think about it. But it is also worth knowing that that's a limiting way of thinking about it because it's not just a tactic, it's a strategy. And I think for me, it's, it's finding all the different ways in which you can use your taxonomy as a strategy, but also as a tactic. Uh, and, and really making sure that you, well, first and foremost, connect your taxonomy to your data. I'm a big proponent of that, just like it's my job. Um, but I think beyond that, making sure that you identify the ways in which having your taxonomy in your CRM can help so that you understand an individual's interests and preferences. Understanding how having it integrated with your email marketing can help so that you can start automating content uh, based on those ideas and interests. And I think the more opportunities you find to make taxonomy a part of your reporting, your analyses, your systems, your, uh, your business logic, your editorial planning process, you're both going to get more value out of your taxonomy and you're also going to create more stakeholders who care. And having more people who care about your taxonomy is gonna improve how well it's managed. 
and it's going to improve that consistency, get you from 1% coverage to maybe 10 or 50 or 70 uh, while you're on your way to automation and you know, artificial intelligence and all that. I think there's a, a lot you can do by making sure you involve the whole organization in your taxonomy, both on the consumption side, but then also on the production side. So I think there's a, yeah, a lot of, a lot of opportunities to grow. Well, thank you both for the wonderful conversation. I know I sure enjoyed it. Dear listener or viewer, if you also did, please like us, uh, send us some comments, share this with a friend. Uh, we are trying to get the word out on lots of different topics and things that we're really passionate about. And you know, if you're feeling this was good in quality, please share it out there um, and let us know too. It, it's fun to see feedback come in. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, until next week, I'm signing off. I'll see you all later. Thank you. Yeah, cheers.